Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our monthly member series. Today we have the pleasure of hearing the story of our friend and neighbor, Richard Dick Wiles, who is the second of a fourth generation Army family spanning World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Panama Canal Operation, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Dick was born in Morgantown, West Virginia, and spent his early life in the Chicago area as the son of an Army medical officer. Dick entered West Point in 1948 and spent 26 years as a U.S. Army officer. He served in Korea and in the United States, commanding several cannon batteries, as well as serving as a staff officer at battalion, brigade, and NATO headquarters. Let's all welcome retired Colonel Dick Wiles. At this time, I was 18 years old and weighed 142 pounds. <laughs> and this picture was taken at about the same time. <laughs> now most of this is about the men in the family because in my area, the men were soldiers. We didn't have many ladies that were in the army as soldiers. But I want to, at this point, give credit to some of my women relatives. In the blue dress, whoops. Okay. Okay. In the blue dress, okay. I'll get the hang of it eventually. In the blue dress is my older daughter, Debbie. She actually has more time in the Army than I do but as a civilian. When she graduated from Iowa State University with a degree in housing and a minor in interior design, she couldn't find a job that suited her and, and her training. Her mother suggested she try the civil service exam. So she did and was hired as a GS4 word processing person. Moving right along the next 20 or 36 years, at the end of her career, she was a GS-15 and was the Army subject matter expert in compensation. She was also in the Pentagon at the time it was attacked. She was in the, the wedge that was attacked. Her office was in the third ring of that wedge. Uh, more about that a little later. Next to her is my younger sister, who was born in Okinawa. She, she likes to have her friends guess where she was born. <laughs> and if you ever have her ask you, it's Uchi Numari. <laughs> now, in this picture are all of my grandsons and their ladies. Uh, you'll hear more about one of them, but uh, there is a soldier in there, too. That, hit that thing again. <laughs> By the time it's over, I'll have to get the hang of this. <laughs> this grandson also spent some time in the Army. And here are my grand great-grandchildren. All these photos were taken... Uh, two years ago at my 90th birthday, which just preceded the COVID. I was one of the last people to have a birthday party in here in the last three years. Now, my dad was the first generation. You heard he was a physician. Uh, actually, he started his military career by enlisting in the National Guard in West Virginia and was very proud of the fact that he attained the rank of, May of corporal. <laughs> then he was commissioned in the infantry when he graduated from West Virginia University. Uh, he did his pre-med and the first years 
two years of medical school at West Virginia University. At that time, West Virginia only had a two-year medical school, but arranged with other medical schools to accept their students to complete their time. So he completed his last two years at the University of Chicago in Rush Medical School. At the time he was in medical in training to be a physician, he was in the uh, Illinois National Guard as a lieutenant. We were stationed at Fort Monmouth when he was uh, commissioned in the regular army. And my dad liked to make weekend trips. And one of those trips happened to be up at West Point. And they, they had a parade the day we were there. And that's when I decided, that's for me. <laughs> Before the end of World War II, he had risen from first lieutenant in 1939 to colonel. One doesn't usually hear of this rapid advancement for other than pilots who had higher casualty rates. But at the end of the war, he hadn't been a colonel for a full year, so they had busted him back to lieutenant colonel. <laughs> but he was re-promoted again in 1952. He retired in, in 1966. In this uh, picture here, taken in New Guinea, where he was first deployed, uh, one of his colleagues and a USO show performer. Anybody tell me who that is? It's not Bob Hope. <laughs> now that you're all this age, you must know Joe E. Brown. <laughs> When I was commissioned, I, I shortly ended up in Korea. Here I was on R&R &R, uh, from Korea, uh, standing in front of my dad's uh, quarters in Tokyo. Now my brother, shown here, nope. <laughs> these two buttons are right close to each other. <laughs> my brother, shown here, uh, wanted to follow in my, our father's footprints, footsteps so he took a pre-med course in, in university. Unfortunately, he neglected to study hard enough that he could get into medical school. So when he graduated uh, ROTC, he was commissioned in the Medical Service Corps. And here he's part of an aid station in an infantry battalion doing some work on the local civilians. And my son is the third generation. Uh, here, my father and I are pinning his second lieutenant bars on when he was commissioned. Uh, you'll notice he's wearing a, he's wearing his parachute badge before he's commissioned. That's because before he went to summer camp his junior year, he volunteered to go to Fort Benning to become a paratrooper. And that paid off for him in his Army career. He was an airborne ranger. He served two tours in the 82nd Airborne Division, a short tour in the 18th Airborne Corps Headquarters, and the Ranger Regiment, three years. That's when he made the jump into Panama, Operation Just Cause. His final year in the Ranger Regiment, he, he was the Headquarters Company Commander. Otherwise, he served in the Berlin Brigade, where his grandfather, had served as the Berlin Command Surgeon and Commander of the Hospital in Berlin. And he had visited his grandfather at Christmas when he was four years old in Berlin. So he was back in the territory. He graduated from the Command and Staff College, but before he was sent to the uh, Command and Staff College to be the aide-de-camp to the uh, Deputy Commandant. His master's thesis has been used as a text at the university ever since. When he finished, he, he, when he finished his tour at the Special Operations Command, which I hadn't said anything about, that is one of the major U.S. commands that includes all the services. He was assigned there uh, after 
finishing Fort Leavenworth, the Command and Staff College. And after that, he, he went to the University of Toledo as the professor of military science. That particular unit was near the bottom of all the ROTCs in the United States, and he was told it was unsatisfactory. Three years later, when he left, it was the second best in the United States. After his three years at the University of Toledo, he went to Saudi Arabia to advise uh, the uh, Saudi Arabia National Guard. Now, don't be confused by that title. The Saudi Arabia National Guard's mission was to protect the royal family. Most of the officers in the National Guard were princes. He was the senior operations and plans advisor. He retired in place there and, and came on board as a civilian where, and was in charge of security and force protection. After he and his wife decided they'd spent enough time in that part of the world, he came back to the United States and joined the Department of Homeland Security, where he was at airports as a federal security officer. And his son, my grand, my, my still, Oh, okay. That, uh, here you go back and think. Okay. This is my uh, great, our grandson, Josh. And here, his father and I are promoting him to lieutenant colonel under the watchful eye of his boss, General or Admiral Richard. Admiral Richard was the commander of the strategic command, and Josh was his aide. Uh, this device on his shoulder is called an agilet, and it's what aids to generals and admirals wear. Uh, that particular agilet was mine when I was aide to a brigadier general. So there I go from one star to a four star. <laughs> now Josh has had quite a career. Uh, He's also airborne and also ranger qualified. He's served a 15-month tour in Iraq. You may remember near the end of our major involvement there, they decided they were going to settle things once and for all. And so they reinforced the U.S. troops there and made them stay for 15 months until they settled things. Then uh, he's had multiple tours in Afghanistan, three in number. He served in three of our divisions, the first, second, and 25th. The 25th, by the way, is in Hawaii. He enjoyed that one. <laughs> in addition to uh, being the aide to the Admiral, actually before that, at Strategic Command, he was a weapons employment officer and a weapons employment officer trainer. He was training other people to do it. And that's when the Admiral selected him to be his uh, aide. Now he's commanding the 1st the, uh, Battalion of the 4th Infantry uh, Battalion in Hohenfels, Germany. Now here's a summary of my education. See, I've attended quite a few schools. <laughs> when I reported to my last high school in Portland, Oregon, with my transcripts, my advisor said, you only need two credits in English to graduate. So I immediately signed up for two courses in English, in addition to some other things to keep me out of trouble, and uh, did graduate or finished high school in mid-year. That gave me an opportunity to enroll at a college level as part of my preparation for going to West Point. When we first arrived in Portland, I wrote to the uh, two senators of the state and the congressman in whose district we uh, resided. Uh, 
requesting an appointment to West Point. The congressman and one of the senators wrote back, thanked me for my application, but told me they'd already filled their quota for the year. Fortunately, the other senator had two vacancies that year, so he appointed me to the bottom of one of the lists. <laughs> Let me just see if I can bend it. Okay, I did bend it a little bit. Yeah, it works great. It's just, I think just... I need all the help I can get. <laughs> anyway, he appointed me a third... <laughs> he appointed me a third alternate on one of his two lists. Uh, I took the exams, the, the physical, the athletic, all the exams, and it turned out I passed them all. And the the candidate who was on the first on my list also passed everything, so he was good to go to West Point. The other list, it turned out, was wiped out. So the uh, senator appointed me as the principal on that list. Uh, I was actually picking strawberries for a farmer. And my mother drove up and I wondered what she was doing there and came and said, they want you at West Point next week. So I dropped my basket of strawberries <laughs> and uh, went home and started packing what few things I needed to go to West Point. My dad bought me a ticket on the train from Portland, Oregon to New York City with a change in Chicago. And spent the night in New York City at the uh, uh, Y and then took a bus up to West Point the next day. I'm going to rush through with these. This is just to give you the idea of the number of different units I was in. Now, for West Point, uh, this is what the academy looks like today. That's the mess hall, and it actually looks pretty much the same as it is when I was a cadet, except now it's seated 2,400 when I was a cadet. Now it's 4,400. This was at a parade just a month ago when I was at West Point for my class's 70th reunion. Needless to say, I was married at West Point. Uh, my first wife, Virginia. We were the last wedding the first day in the cadet chapel. Starting at noon on graduation day, which was just after the graduation, every half hour there was a wedding. If you, were, if you were booked into the cadet chapel, you had 30 minutes to get your people in, get married, and get out. <laughs> My, we being the last day, one of the day, did not confront that. But the chaplain who married us was pretty beat. <laughs> After graduation in the past, uh, the newly commissioned officers were given 60 days of vacation to sort of wear out, get down from being a cadet for four years. Uh, the war in Korea started in the summer of 1950. So a lot of the newly commissioned lieutenants were recalled from that 60 days of vacation and immediately sent to Korea with no other training. They have suffered high casualties. So they t this chain decided to change the system so that before going to Korea, an officer had to be branch qualified. He had to know what to do as an infantryman, an artilleryman, an engineer. And he had to have had at least 90 days with soldiers so he could learn how to, to communicate with and order soldiers. So in my case, I took my artillery branch training at Fort Hill, Oklahoma, and went to the 1st Armored Division, Fort Hood, Texas, for my 90 days. Now my 90 days turned out to be two and a half months. 
I got my orders telling me when to report to Camp Stoneman, California for forward transportation to Korea. And uh, my wife at the time was seven months pregnant. And so we uh, bundled up all what a few effects we had accumulated as a, a second lieutenant at that point. I put her in the car and took her home to her mother. <laughs> now she was a nurse and uh, she, being with her mother put her in close proximity to the hospital where she was trained. So that when uh, our older daughter was delivered, it was back in her hospital by physicians that she knew. Now, when I got to Camp Stoneman, which is, I said, was the processing center to get all the people, officers and soldiers, uh, over to Japan and then subsequently to uh, Korea. When they looked at me and they saw my cross cannons on my collar, they said, oh, there's a critical shortage of uh, artillery officers. You have to fly. So all the people that arrived with me the next day went down and boarded a Navy ship. Similar to this is an APA that, uh, did that look like an APA? <laughs> anyway, they boarded an APA and off to Japan. I had to check the bulletin board every day to see if I was scheduled for a flight. It turned out that there were high priority things being shipped to the Far East, particularly Korea, by the Air Force, and they had no transportation available to fly people, just f flying material. Eventually, the Air Force leased airplanes, and this is before jets, you'll notice. And so, after having been at Camp Stoneman for a couple of weeks, I was finally boarded an aircraft like that and flew to Hawaii because these airplanes did not have the endurance that our airplanes today. We refueled in Korea and then flew on towards Wake where we were to refuel again. A couple of hours into the flight from, from Hawaii, one of the guys looked back, there's a strange airplane flying back there. About that time, the captain came on and he said, one of our engines is bad, we've got to go back to Hawaii and replace it. And that airplane flying behind us is called a Dumbo. It's a B-17 with a raft underneath it. If we had to make a water landing, the raft would have been la dropped for us to get on. <laughs> well, we, we made it back to uh, Hawaii, enjoyed a good dinner in town while they changed the engine on our airplane. And the next day we flew off to Wake and subsequently to, to Japan. When I arrived in Korea, the 92nd Armored Field Artillery, and reported to the battalion commander, his first words were, what am I gonna do with another lieutenant? <laughs> Remember, there was a shortage. Well, he assigned me to B Battery, and where my first job was a reconnaissance officer. An artillery battery has two major parts. The biggest part are the cannon or rockets or whatever armament they have. In this case, it was 655 millimeter self-propelled cannon. And each cannon had a crew of 18, which is more than they needed. But remember, we're in a war and they're firing around the clock. So it's, it's, it's not just that one time. Uh, the recon officer, commands everything else in the battery, not the guns. Survey, mess hall, maintenance, communications, all belong to the recon officer. Now, part of my job as a recon officer was to occasionally go to a observation post overlooking the Chinese lines. And these are the Chinese lines seen through a, a powerful telescope. If I did, did, were to find any action going on over there, I'd shoot at it using our guns. And this is the kind of a gun that we had. 
It's just fired around. After the peace treaty was signed in June of 1953, uh, the Army sent the National Guard officers and the reserves home. So the only ones left were the regulars. The same thing happened to my dad in World War II when he was in the Philippines. All the reserves went home and he got to spend another year in the Philippines. <laughs> uh, so I became a battery commander as a new, new first lieutenant with two second lieutenants uh, to, to do the rest of the work in the battery. And one so Saturday morning, we lined up the, the battery. This is the firing battery where all the soldiers are. And back here is the part that I had commanded. But here I am now as the commander. After the war ended, I requested a transfer to Japan. They sent me to, back to Japan in December, where I became the aide de camp to Brigadier General Homer Case. And remember, I told you about that, that little gold agilette. When I was appointed the general's aide, I went to the uniform store to buy an agilette. They said, We don't have any. Uh, go to the Takashimaya. Takashimaya is a very famous department store in Tokyo. So I went to the Takashimaya with a, with a picture of the Agilette, and I said, I need one of these. No problem, come back tomorrow. I came, went back tomorrow, and I got my Agilette. <laughs> now, this family down here, uh, this was my dad's interpreter. And after my dad had left Japan, he invited me to dinner at his house in Yokohama. And here he is with his wife, his mother, and his father. His father had worked for Ford Motor Company. He knew the, the word of every part of a Ford in English, but that's all the English he knew. <laughs> <laughs> then when the general retired, I was transferred to Okinawa to the 29th, which became 75th regimental combat team. And I've depicted here uh, some of the Christmas decorations that our uh, soldiers came up with. The one here was one from the battery I was assigned in, and it's made from our camouflage netting. This is a 280 millimeter cannon. I was in a 105 millimeter battery. But there was a battalion of these on the island with us. And I was detailed to be an evaluator when they had to take a test. And uh, that was an, quite an experience. This cannon has a range of 20 miles. And it's designed for one purpose, to shoot a nuclear weapon. And what this test considered of was finding a suitable place where they could put the cannon in, compute the uh, firing data to shoot to a target which had been given to them, and shoot a spotter round. They always f fired a spotter round before a nuke. And uh, the only time that they ever fired a nuke from one of these cannons was at White Sands. went back to Fort Sill, and the first was a school called Fassenbach, Field Artillery and Surface-to-Surface -surface Missile Battery Officer Course. In this course, we learned every weapon that the field artillery owned. Let's just try to do something else so it doesn't peak. Okay. I don't know why it's doing that. actually a very good microphone. Let me try to clip it onto your shirt. Okay. That way it won't go anywhere. <laughs> there. Okay. You may remember that neither the Air Force or the Navy could launch a satellite. The Army actually launched the first satellite for the U.S. And it was done with one of the rockets that I learned to uh, use. 
the redstone. After the school, which was a nine-month course, I went off to try to learn to fly airplanes. That's not listed there, but that's because it didn't last long before they found out I was not would not be safe to myself or any other passengers if I was flying an airplane. So I went back to Fort Sill as a tactical officer in the officer candidate school. That was another brief assignment because I was promoted to captain at this point and then went off to command another battery. This one, a 155 battery. And these are my soldiers, only five of them manning the howitzer. At one point in my command tour, a, a unit was pulled from supporting this school they fire artillery so the officers could learn how to adjust the fire and that sort of thing. And so they issued me six 105s in addition to my six 155s. So I 12 became a 12-gun battery, which is two-thirds of a battalion. <laughs> uh, at one point, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to have all 12 guns in the field supporting the school. The first sergeant and I were on the rammer staff of one of the 155s. From there, I went to US Army Europe to special troops. Special troops are units in the Army that uh, has all the odds and ends they can't assign to someplace else. For example, we had three companies where all the soldiers that were in the headquarters were billeted and messed. A company had all the general staff, the G1, G2, G3, G4. B company had the special staff, the quartermaster general, the adjutant general, and that sort of thing. The third company had all the women, because the women were not yet integrated in the army. We had a band. And here you see our band, and the officer that's escorting the admiral here is my classmate who's commanding the MP company, which was the honor guard. The Russians and the Allied forces negotiated three access lanes to Berlin at the end of the war. Most people are familiar with the air lanes, which we had to use at one time when the Russians shut down the railway and the highway. The rail, we, when the railway guard, when the railway was restored as a way to get to Berlin, we had a company of military police that were guards on that train to keep the Soviets and the East Germans off. We also had a customs company. We did not want to offend the Germans because by then we'd ended the occupation and wanted to obey all their customs laws, but only with our own soldiers. So this MP customs unit were our customs uh, unit. Turned out to be good when I was first assigned to special troops. I was met at the foot of the plane by a military policeman who was sure he had me and my family. He said, please come this way. Took me into a room, said, there's a car on its way from Heidelberg to pick you up. He was part of the customs unit. He knew I was going to the headquarters, so he was taking care of me. <laughs> we also had an aviation detachment, which uh, uh, became very essential when, uh, with one of the jobs that I had. The Finance Center, which handled all the money in, for the Army in Europe to pay th things that we bought. Three kinds of engineer units. A little engineer platoon had to take care of all the maintenance requirements of the headquarters. An intelligence engineer battalion their mission was to find out the capability of roads and bridges beyond the border so that if we were attacking after being attacked by the Soviets, 
we would know what bridges our tanks could would accommodate our tanks and other vehicles, and other kinds of intelligence that would be of interest. And a map depot. The, the map depot kept all the maps up to date so that if we were called to fight, we could get the latest maps to use in the endeavor. The map depot was in Bordeaux. I enjoyed visiting them. <laughs> <laughs> in transportation, we had two truck companies whose mission was to move the headquarters in wartime to a safer place. Actually, next to us was Central Army Group, which you see down here is one of the, where we had liaison detachments. A lot of the officers assigned to the headquarters, U.S. Army Europe, and special troops had wartime assignments to Central Army Group, which in peacetime was located near us in Mannheim, Germany. The Adjutant General was a personnel replacement company. Uh, while I was in special troops, we had the best basketball team in Europe. How did we manage that? Well, there was a detachment of the Adjutant General Replacement Company at Fort Dix, where the soldiers reported before coming into Germany. And they reviewed their records. They had basketball players, six feet six. You're going to special troops. <laughs> and a training aids depot. Okay, mention these liaison detachments. Uh, the senior one was Allied Forces Central Europe, which was located back in France. Uh, and it commanded, actually, CENTAG, the, one, the group that I just mentioned. British Army of the Rhine, which was in northern Germany. French Forces Germany. And then the Central Army Group. Here is one of the first versions of the Berlin Wall. My dad was in Berlin at the time it went up. And he saw it under construction. And a German has put it on the, the wall in tyranny. But my duties when I was in special troops first was an assistant S3 plans and operations officer. S2 security intelligence and security officer. And finally, S1 personnel and gatekeeper. The job that gave me the opportunity to go out and visit other units was the security. Each one of the liaison detachments had to undergo an inspection every year. And it was my job to make sure they passed the security part of that that their documents were protected and it were properly annotated and recorded. So I had to visit all four of those units. Uh, first time I ate in, ate in a British officer's mess and I thought it would be the last. Cause <laughs> it was an Irish stew. And I love Irish stew, but not made by a Brit. The French, of course, you know, did a lot better meal-wise. And as I mentioned, the, the, the trip back to uh, Bordeaux, there I was flown back by our detachment, and the, the pilot stayed with me on this case. Most of the times they'd take me, drop me, and then come pick me back up. And they say, me, it's always me and my sergeant. I go for a show, and he goes to do the work. But anyway, uh, we uh, went to the dining room in the hotel where we were staying, and uh, the maitre d' saw three young Americans, probably loaded. So he comes to the part where he's going to take our wine order, and he brings up this bottle all covered with cobwebs and, and dust. And one of the pilots said, and how much is that? We immediately sent it back down to the cellar. <laughs> Enjoyed something a lot less formidable. <laughs> From there, I went off to Fort Leavenworth to be, learn to be a 
higher level staff officer. And this is uh, the headquarters building at Fort Leavenworth. And from there, the Army sent me to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute to become an operations research analyst, also known as the management sciences, which is what they call it at RPI. So after two years, I graduated and went back to the Army, to the Army staff. And here, this is the wedge that was attacked by the airplane. And if you count, there are five rings here. And my daughter was in the third ring back here. The airplane actually hit right about there. She was actually on the telephone when the airplane hit. Knocked the telephone out of her hand. And uh, there was a lieutenant colonel next to her. She, and he said, Debbie, let's get out of here. And he escorted her out of, out of the building. And he went back to re rescue other people. She's had some PTSD problems since this. Her mother and I didn't know where she was or how she was doing until six o'clock in the evening of the attack. She had to walk because they secured all the vehicles in the parking lots. She had to walk to the next uh, uh, underground system. And fortunately, she ran into her call pro mate while she was one who had the same idea. Her carpool mate called her mother, who lived on the line, to be at the station to pick them up when they arrived there. And she subsequently took Debbie home. I was assigned to the Army Information and Data Systems, AIDS, which didn't have an unpopular connotation in those days. <laughs> uh, our mission was to prepare recommendations for the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Army concerning purchase of computers. The time we're talking about computers means mainframe computers. Laptops hadn't been invented yet. We're talking about the likes of IBM 360s. We would take the requests for the computers, analyze their needs, whether or not the computer they wanted was the proper, appropriate one, put together all the paperwork, ship it up to the chief of staff and the secretary to approve it or not approve it. Towards the end of uh, that period, I was asked to accompany another officer to, to Germany where we had installed a relatively small computer to take care of all the personnel needs of the division. And this was a test case and we went over to see how it worked out. When I got back, I went to my office, opened the door, and it was a complete disaster. The walls were down, furniture was gone, so I went to the administrative officer and said, what happened? Oh, we reorganized while you were gone. <laughs> Your old office is going to be an office for a three-star general, so it has to be improved. So I, I found that we had a temporary office in, in the inner rings. Of the, of the, this, this was in the, C, the D ring. And uh, I found that my boss, the director, and the executive officer had both retired as soon as they found it was being reorganized. There were left three full colonels who were commanding sub-elements and a GS-15. Uh, so I got them all together and I said, we have our job, we need to reorganize this to take on the additional duties that they're giving us. And so the three colonels and the civilian and I established Management Information Systems Directorate where we had the same mission as the old AIDS plus in addition to organizing the office, I had to write job descriptions for new people who had needed to be hired, uh, acquire furniture for them to use when they were doing their job, actually help hire them. In the case of the officers, it was easy. All I, could, all I needed to do was tell them what office I was in, the personnel people, and they would slip me the 
papers of the officers I wanted, or I could see if they were really the ones I wanted, and then I'd get them. After being executive officer for about a year, I, I became assistant development officer when I got done in the nitty gritty of what we did. At that point, I volunteered for Korea, or Vietnam, I've already been to Korea. So I was sent to the artillery school for a brief course on how artillery was different in Korea than what I'd learned about other things. But I reported to the 4th Infantry Division and was assigned to the direct support battalion of the uh, 3rd Brigade of the 4th Infantry Division. It was the 2nd Howitzer Battalion of the 9th Artillery. Now here's another test. We had another USA visitor. Can anybody tell me who that is? Well, I had, one of our stops, as we were getting out of the helicopter, a soldier looked up and came running over to us and said, I know you, you're Pat O'Brien. <laughs> I've watched all your movies on late TV. <laughs> Well, on discussing with Pat uh, during our movements, he told me that he'd been in the Navy in World War I, and he was a gunner's mate. So I gave him an opportunity to be a gunner's mate on one of my guns. <laughs> this is the way we moved. We were in the highlands in Vietnam, and the roads weren't safe. So airplanes came and picked up our Actually, they'd pick up our soldiers first who would be on board, and then they'd pick up the cannon and some ammunition and section equipment. And this is what a, a battery position would look like. I was actually the commander of the battalion for nine months. The division artillery commander believed in keeping the officers in the job as long as they were doing the job. And so my predecessor had commanded the battalion for a year. Then we got a new division commander. And he had a friend that he wanted to give my battalion to. So I, I, at this point, I was the longest serving battalion commander at nine months. And so I was transferred. Gave up command of the battalion. Transferred back to first field force. The field force was a three-star level command with divisions under it. They called them corps elsewhere, but they called them field forces in Vietnam because the, the Vietnamese army had corps, and they didn't want to confuse things by having our corps and their corps. So we had field force. And uh, my first job, briefly, was as G3 Air, where I was the contact with the Air Force in getting direct air support. The Air Force had what they called a direct air support center, which moved right in with us. And it was commanded by a colonel. And if we needed air support, I would talk to that colonel and he'd arrange it. Turned out that colonel had been in the same company I was in at West Point, two classes ahead of me. So there was no problem with our relationship. Now, when I was back commanding the battalion, this was my office and my quarters. <laughs> and when I moved to field force, this was my quarters. <laughs> Natrang, where we were located, is a beach city, and the beach was on the other side of the road. <laughs> so my last three months were not all unpleasant. From there, I went directly to Belgium. Went, stopped in the States only to pick up my family to take with me. At the, at the time, the United States lines were having trouble staying afloat. So the armed forces were using their ships to get us from the States over to Europe. So we went to Europe on the SS United States. The problem with the SS United States is it's the fastest ship on the line. And they make it from New York 
to England in four days. <laughs> it's a very short cruise. <laughs> that was just a stop in England, then was another day to France where we uh, downloaded. Now, I'm not showing anything about shape, but what we have here in two of these pictures are uh, Mardi Gras. And somebody told us about the Gilles of Bench. Did I pronounce that properly? <laughs> now, th these are the Gilles. Uh, and when they're young, they start off with a very modest uniform. As they get older and richer, they, they supplement their uniform. Now, you'll notice they've got something in their hands. That something's an orange. In their other hand, they've got a basket. And in that basket are more oranges. Now, what they're supposed to do when they march is throw the oranges to the participants. But sometimes they, they have other thoughts and, and see if they can break some windows. Or, or some signs. And so most of the windows and the signs would have wire netting over them to protect them. These are Belgian gendarmes. And they were the first element in the parade, so everybody knew they were there. When my wife found out that I was being transferred after only a year in Belgium, she decided we were going to see everything we could see in the time that was left. And uh, Brussels is one of them. This, this was left over from the World's Fair. If you don't remember, it's called the Atomium. From there, I did go to the War College, which is preparation for high-level staff and command. The War College is at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, which is the second oldest continually occupied army installation. The first oldest is West Point. <laughs> Among other things you may remember, Carlisle Barracks is where the, an Indian school was established. And the stadium at Carlisle Barracks is, is the Thorpe Stadium, who was a, a noted Indian athlete. After completing the War College, went back to Rensselaer to get a PhD. And while there, I took all the required courses that a, a doctoral candidate had to, uh, enrolled us in some others that would be interesting, and took all of the uh, exams, both written and oral, and then was ready to work on my dissertation and my thesis advisor took a sabbatical. And they couldn't find a suitable thesis advisor for me so that my time expired before I had a suitable proposal for the dissertation. So I left Rensselaer with an ABD, all but dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> and they shipped me back to the Pentagon. And I was in the program analysis and evaluation directorate. I hear a short course on how the Department of Defense is funded. Every year they have a budget. Four years before the budget, they have four programs, which is what they want to do during those four years if they have the money. And actually, back beyond the five years, there's a 15-year annex. Because if you're going to buy a weapon system, you can't buy a weapon system in four years or five years. So you have to start planning way back. And that was our job, to make sure that these things happened. Actually, the Department of Defense would send us uh, parameters. The amount of money they projected that we'd get. And then we had to divide up the money to the various spenders and get their input back, put it all together, and send it back to the Office of Secretary of Defense as a program objective memorandum. Dick, question? Did you want to... you six... Okay, I got you. She's telling me I'm running out of time, but I'm also running out of things to say. So. <laughs> 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 
anyway, uh, after that, I was transferred to the Center for what's now the Center for Army Analysis, where we did cost benefit of analysis for major weapon systems. Uh, here is the M60 tank, and it was an upgrade to the tank. Uh, this is now the uh, V-22 in the Marines and the Air Force. This is uh, the attack helicopter in the Army, and this is the Army's main battle attack. We evaluated those systems and advised the Secretary of the, uh, the Chief of Staff and Secretary of the Army, and eventually the Secretary of Defense on what systems we needed to acquire. Now, f for these two systems, they were not just those systems. In addition to the tank, which was a paper tank in those days, we uh, considered an, a further upgrade of this tank as a candidate, the German equivalent of the same tank and the British equivalent of the same tank. So in our analysis, we did everything four times, one for each system, so we'd get a comparison. In my back pocket, while we were doing the attack helicopter, I had a representative of the General Accounting Office to make sure I wasn't pulling any strings and trying to get away with anything. We had some fun at CAA, too. These were all the directors of CAA. Then I retired. But I think I'll stop there in case you have any questions. After you finished your military career, what did you do? Okay, that's what this slide's about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, actually, I went to work for a company called ORI Incorporated, where I was a team leader we're putting on field experiments at the place you're familiar with uh, in California, uh, Fort Hunter Leggett, uh, where we were to test a high mobility light armored vehicle. Now, such a thing didn't exist, so we had a surrogate. And the surrogate was an M44 light tank that was used in armored divisions with a big engine, so big it didn't fit in it. It, it, it was on the outside. And we did a series of, well, my job was to design the experiments, record the data, and analyze what happened, and make suitable recommendations. After that died, I did a few other things, including one for the Navy <laughs> on non-acoustic anti-submarine warfare, which I cannot elaborate on. <laughs> Then I went to the Army, or the Military Operations Research Society, and uh, stayed there 16 years as the Executive Vice President. When I arrived there, Natalie was there as the Secretary. She was the only other full-time employee. Uh, it didn't take me long to find out that she was a lot smarter than I was. And uh, I, I couldn't run the organization by myself, so she became my deputy. And one of the first people I hired was Cynthia, who became my uh, better person and did all the other work for me. Stayed there, as I said, for 16 years. Retired shortly after turning 70. Did that answer your question, Tom? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Big thank you for an outstanding presentation. That was the most interesting. Uh, thank you for coming. Next uh, month, the second uh, Monday of the month, we have Jerry Binns as a speaker. He's going to talk about he moved here in Hilton Head full time 45 years ago. <laughs> so tell, me, tell us all about the growth of uh, Hilton Head and his experiences um, going way back. Thank you for coming.
Hope you have a good night. Enjoy.